the monthly March 24th monthly meeting at the Dickinson County School Board is now in session. For the record, I would like to recognize that all of our school board members are present, in addition to Tanya Baker, board clerk, Scott Mullen, school board attorney, and Mrs. Robinson, division superintendent. At this time, would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and the moment of silence. <coughs> Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Board members, we have the agenda for tonight's meeting. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Good evening, uh, Mr. Mullins and board members. There is one recommended change. In item H, uh, we are asking the board to consider removing approval and replacing it with discussion of the participation for the 2021-22 DCPS virtual regional program. We are not prepared to make a recommendation to the board, but we will continue that uh, discussion, um, and I will explain why. So that's the only change that we have at this time. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda with a recommended change? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Motion carries. That brings us to public comment. Mr. Hicks, will you please read the guidelines for public comment? Thank you. Mr. Setzer, will you please be our timekeeper? A period of time for public comment will be designated on the meeting agenda during which the public may comment on issues related to public education. The Dickinson County School Board believes that citizens of the county should be heard and that it is an acceptable format for receiving public comment. After the public comment section of the meeting is closed, the public shall not be allowed to participate in general board member discussions regarding agenda items. Public participation with the board members regarding agenda items can be disruptive and the practice is prohibited by Robert's Rules of Order. It is the desire of the school board to treat each member of the public fairly and equally. Allowing one individual to participate while excluding others is unfair. The board may hold such public hearings as may be necessary to allow the public to more fully express their concerns, or the board may place the public comment section of any meeting at the end of the meeting to allow additional public comments. While we do not wish to restrict the free expression of opinion, we feel that certain restrictions may be necessary so that the order and reasonable standards of decorum may be maintained. We ask that the following standards be adhered to. The speaker will be recognized by the chair, each speaker will be limited to five minutes. Speakers will refrain from the use of vulgarity or profanity and will avoid negative or embarrassing comments directed towards specific children or students. Board members should not respond to issues presented by speakers unless clarification is necessary. Matters of concern raised under public comment will be referred to the proper official for investigation and future board consideration if necessary. If any members of the public would like to call in and speak during public comment, please call 835-1620. For public comment, we'd like to recognize Kathy Music with VPE. After comments, Phyllis Mullins with DEA. I, d I don't believe Ms. Music is here if Ms. Mullins would like to uh, come forward. <coughs> Um, the VEA had their annual convention this past weekend, which was held virtually. And um, during our new business item section, we did come up with some new legislative items that we will work on um, probably this summer. And I will uh, 
be part of that as I'm part of the legislative committee. Um, we, as always, we want to push forward everything for public education that we can possibly push, uh, especially trying to raise teacher salaries to the national average. We try, <laughs> but we know that for uh, back here, the national average is going to be out of reach as far as we, uh, the average for Virginia is much higher in Northern Virginia than it is for us. Therefore, when they take the average, that doesn't really pertain to us as much. But we're trying to get as much as we can, especially for Southwest Virginia. Um, I'm real proud of the budget that has been prepared, and I thank Mr. Vickers and our new financial director. I think everybody's done a wonderful job, and I'm ready to help push it forward, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak during public comment? Again, the phone number for the public to speak is 835-1620. Oh, I see Miss Music. Miss Music, would you like to would you like to speak? Okay. Our next agenda item is the consent agenda, which includes the approval of minutes, approval of monthly bills, discussion of school activity funds, and approval of elementary school construction invoices and the approval of the construction account reconciliation document. Any questions or discussion on the consent agenda? Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Our next agenda item is information for the school board, Mrs. Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and good evening, board members. Uh, information for the board uh, this evening um, is, includes the VSBA virtual conferences and seminars. Uh, we have several of those listed for you. If you are interested in attending those, uh, please let us know, and please contact Tanya Baker, and she will be more than happy to um, help you to register uh, those. Also, um, Dr. Ryle, I know that we have the spring conference um, for the VSBA, our regional, and that's in April also, is it not? Yes. Okay. And so, um, again, if you'd like to attend any of these conferences uh, there, and we will send you information on that. I know that Dr. Lyle has also sent you information on that. Um, also information for the board is just uh, textbook adoption. Uh, process for grades four and five and, and six through 12. And so you could uh, look at that um, at your convenience uh, as we look at adopting uh, textbooks, English textbooks in those areas. Um, one of our last items on the information on the board is uh, the update on the copyright of the Ridgeview logo. And I'd like to ask uh, Scott Mullins, our school board attorney, and Mr. Setzer, uh, to come, please, and share with the board uh, the update on the copyright of the Ridgeview logo. Some of you have asked me about this, and we have not had this on the agenda, and so we thought that this would be a good time to do that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sessor. I don't think my mic is working, so not working out there, is it? Can you hear me? Yeah. Mic working? Okay. <laughs> um, this is something that the new members of the board 
um, we probably have never talked about, and uh, we've rarely talked about it since we began, but uh, back in, I think it was uh, 2015, it's hard to believe it's been that long since the school was opening, uh, we were in a situation where we were opening this new school and we needed helmets, jerseys, uh, all of our athletic equipment, and the arrangement we had with the Corps of Engineers and the arrangement we had with the three boards involved was that we could use the Corps of Engineers money for infrastructure, for building the school, for the fields, but we couldn't use it for uh, apparel, athletic gear, things like that. And that put us uh, as a school system and as a county in a pretty difficult situation because it takes a lot of money to throw together to, uh, you know, to, to put a, field, a team on the field for fall sports. And then after fall sports, you know, we had the, the winter sports, the spring sports, and putting this all together was, uh, was quite an ordeal. Uh, I was lucky to work with a team from uh, all three communities um, that included at that time, and I don't want to, I know I'll leave someone out, but I remember we had then head coach uh, Rick Mullins with Clintwood and James Colley with Hayside um, had a, a, a group, and it was seven or eight people, Mike, it was including administrators. Yeah, my, you were on the committee. Yeah. And so what we did was we put out an RFP, a request for proposals, and we got uh, a tremendous amount of uh, work going at one time to procure, because under state law we have to go at, at it uh, under the procurement laws to, to get this equipment. We didn't have any money. <laughs> So uh, we went out and sold ads, and uh, I, I will always uh, thank Mr. Shanghai Nichols because Shanghai uh, was quite the salesman, and he was out selling ads. Uh, it was at sometimes a challenge as an attorney to keep up with the uh, commitments Shanghai was making out there shaking hands, <laughs> but eventually uh, we, we were able to uh, get it tied down and we raised a substantial amount of money to help us get started. But we, our procurement um, included a lot of things. One procurement included, as I recall, the um, glass rings, cap and gowns, uh, athletic wear. Um, what else am I leaving out? I think, uh, if I remember correctly, basically we went into this looking to outfit our athletic teams and um, for what these vendors could provide our athletic teams, and those came along as uh, extras, uh, diplomas, yearbook, uh, and another piece that eventually was dropped into this was the branding process, which we weren't really thinking about at the time, but it, it helped us make our decision on who to go with. And, and we were forced to make it quickly because our they were building the gym, the final stages of the gym, and they said, if you want a logo on your gym, you need to be coming up with something quickly. And so we weren't really familiar with the concept of branding and what that meant. And uh, so we got uh, with a group that uh, retained artists from California and the logos that uh, you'll see, you've seen them around, and Mike will, will show you more of the ones on your face mask. I usually carry a notebook that has uh, the Ridgeview logos. We ended up, I think, with 11 logos that are original art. They're not clip art like you get when you, um, when you go to the internet, but th this is original art. Your, they, this, your masks, a lot of the things you see are original art. And uh, we have trademarked 11 of our logos. And uh, without trying to uh, go too deep into the law, when you think about the smiley face, 
that was on Forrest Gump and that you saw in the 70s that later became the Walmart logo. Uh, that's a trademark logo. And those things are literally worth millions of dollars. And so the things that we have here are trademarked. Now, if you go out in our community, the, the prior school boards, have, we made a conscious decision that we would allow local vendors to come up with their own art and sell their own uh, designs. And uh, I'm sure, uh, and Mike could maybe speak more to this, that at times schools have gone through local vendors and used things other than a trademarked art uh, to raise the funds. But the point that uh, I want to make sure the school board understands and the thing that I really think is a foundation we can build off of is that um, this art is important. It belongs to the children of Dickinson County. And when you buy this, you have the right to believe and think that part of the money that you spend is in some way going to help education. And that is something that um, we need to do a better job of getting the word out to the communities and to, to honor this because it has potential value to you. Uh, you probably don't realize, or maybe all of you don't realize, we have an internet store. Uh, you can go on the internet and buy various pieces of apparel, uh, cups, things like that, with our logo on it. Um, I believe, although we're not, um, I'm not exactly sure of the details, but we can be found on Amazon. <laughs> uh, and, you know, our, our apparel is there to buy. We get a check. And if we go to a big box retailer and we see our logoed apparel, then we can ask for, they're not supposed to be doing that. But if they do, generally speaking, it's like a 15% uh, royalties that should be coming back over to us, and they should only be doing it with their permission. Now, I, I'm just the, the lawyer that, that did this and knows a little bit about the law. I really don't know a lot about uh, you know, what has gone on where the rubber meets the road in the schools. But this is the thing uh, that I want us as a school board to at least begin to think about when you see the art that Mike is going to show you uh, on the PowerPoint, um, that belongs to the children of Dickinson County. And we want to encourage, uh, like I, I drove through Clintwood the other day, I saw some of our trademarked art was up, and that was great, you know, and, and on, the, uh, on the light poles in Clintwood. To see our support for our, uh, our school, I think that's tremendous. Uh, it, within the community, I think that's tremendous. But when people are making money, even uh, no matter how small, off of our trademarked art, we have an obligation to at least make sure that they sign an agreement recognizing that they do that with our consent and permission. Because if you don't protect your property, then it becomes part of what the, the law considers the public domain, which means that uh, you can lose it. So as we go forward and, and we're doing things, uh, just sort of imprint, if you can, uh, the logos uh, that Mike's going to show you. and. Uh, and keep those in the back of your mind as you go forward and you're purchasing things for your family. You know, try to buy things that you know uh, some of the money will come back to the school. And, and, and um, on another note, if you notice something out, we don't always know what's going on in the community either. So if you, if you do uh, see a T-shirt in a store, there's a good chance, or if you just let us know, we could check it out to make sure it's legit. Uh, uh, we've gone as far as to Pennsylvania uh, to protect the logo, and when I say go, it's usually a phone call. 
uh, but there was a new school being built up there and by chance it was called Ridgeview High School as well and they were using our logo uh, I guess as a stand-in as it turned out till they developed their own. Uh, Wolfpack is very popular. I think there's a school being built in the Tri-City area right now basically with the same colors and it's going to they're going to be the uh, more or less Ridgeview Wolfpack as well. So. Uh, uh, when it's brought to our attention, if we, uh, we don't always catch it, but we will check into it. So we ask for the public's help there as well. And Mike, is it 11 logos we have? We have 11, uh, 11 pieces of art. They're all derived from the very first piece. And uh, Ryan, if you go to the next slide, if you all can see where you're sitting, if you need to move. Uh, this is our primary logo. Uh, as Mr. Mullins st said, we started, actually, I think it was, uh, uh, it was over the Christmas, Christmas time of 2014-15 because we had to work over Christmas. This was a three or, month, three or four month process to get this completed, uh, meeting with folks in California. Uh, you see the colors, they're all, uh, we have a specific color scheme. The blue is really the hardest color to match. It's called electric blue. Uh, it's a, uh, that's a term they use for it. It's not a Carolina blue or a Kentucky blue. It's, a, it's called electric blue. And it's, a, it's, a, it's tough to match on uniforms and everything else, but we've been pretty successful doing that. So everything you see from this point forward is going to be derived off this primary logo. Next slide. This is the secondary. And really, the only difference in the secondary logo uh, several members of the committee thought that they wanted to have a ridge line or a view, a ridge view, and you can see that in the ridge view, the word ridge view, as a gray area down at the bottom of the word. Next slide, please. And this Mike, uh, the, um, the three wolves represent uh, something very special uh, to our school division, and that's the three high schools. It does, and Unity, it's a pack. Plus, there's not, we're not, we, tr we try not to look back. If you look, uh, they're looking to the side and to the front. We're always moving forward and to the side and protecting each other. Uh, this is the tertiary piece of art. Uh, this is common on hats, well, uh, T-shirts as well, but uh, basically the word Ridgeview is removed from it. Next slide. Out of that original piece of art came the word marks. Uh, again, you can see the pattern. Uh, they're all the same with the exception of the top one is straight lined rather than curved as it was in the original piece. Next, li next slide, please. <clears throat> These are the three mascots that, were, were, that came from the original piece of art. Uh, all three of these are, you, fi you can find them fairly common, especially on hats and t-shirts. Next slide. This is the interlock. Uh, a lot of discussion about the interlock back in 2015. <laughs> um, this is what the committee ended up going with. It's kind of hard to duplicate. It's, uh, screen printing is kind of expensive, especially if you use all colors, uh, but it's ours. It's the identity of Ridgeview High School. And finally, I think the last slide, this is the sport mark. Basically, any athletic team, uh, it doesn't have to be football, it can be basketball, it can be cheerleading, it can be volleyball, whatever. This is the sport mark. Uh, that was developed by VIP branding uh, in California. And I think that's the last one, Ryan, if you'll go one more. So those are our 11 pieces of art that is unique to Ridgeview, and uh, we try to protect it as much as possible. We do get requests to use it. Unfortunately, we've had to tell some no, uh, especially if, if they're trying to use it to make a profit. Um, and again, I'm sure it's being used in other places that we don't know about. All you got to do is Google it. If you Google Ridgeview High School, uh, it's easy to copy and paste and clip and put on anything you want. Uh, but again, we do try to protect it the best we can. Hey, Mike, was there ever any discussion uh, back during that time about having that logo on the football field? It's, it's noticeably absent. The football field was actually completed before we got around before this. you got to that yeah but you do you do see it in the gym if you walk in the gym yeah and it looks great it's, it's, it's beautiful. beautiful it is if i'm thinking correct the football you're field correct. is completely you're correct right. yes but there was plenty of talk of how to rectify that in the future some way 
Yeah, I'd like to see us do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, everything was uh, very moving very quickly at that time. Um, and I think what, there wasn't a plan, and Scott might interrupt me here, there wasn't a plan to go this way. Uh, we first had a committee that decided on the names and the mascot and all of those kinds of things. And um, when we realized that we had to outfit a complete sports team and there were no funds, that's when we thought, oh my gosh, what. This w and this was in December. We were opening up in August. Oh, yeah. So the football team, I remember that we had to order their equipment first, mm -hmm. correct? And, All uh, sports, yes. We had yes. to get the orders in as quick as we could. And so, um, <coughs> so that's what occurred. That was, uh, the school was well represented. That group of people uh, really went uh, above and beyond working through holidays, um, working through a lot of nuance to get where they were. And, uh, uh, and, and I, I really think if you look at those logos, uh, we should take pride in those because th those are original. You know, that's, that's not something that uh, you just can go anywhere and get. You know, those were made for Ridgeview. And uh, I hope that in the future we can use those to the school's advantage. Ms. Robinson might uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but like our in-school store here, uh, the mm -hmm. proceeds from this, that goes to our career technical. Yes, sir. That's correct. And so, you know, the school board will always have uh, control over that. But for things that uh, need help, uh, your logos are, are there and, uh, and you know, we should always be <coughs> thinking of ways to aggressively promote our school by promoting those logos. And we've had plenty of other schools uh, contact us about the use of our logos. Evidently, Wolfpack is a very popular name. Uh, the colors were different and we had one school, I remember, is down deep south. Uh, asked us for permission to use the logo, but changing the colors. And of course we refused because we want it to be Ridgeview High School. Uh, but most people try to do the right thing when it comes to our logos. Uh, they'll ask before they use. And uh, we appreciate that as, as we would them if it was theirs. And you know, to, to make sure you understand this, all those logos are registered with the Virginia State Corporation Commission. And so when you register those as a trademark, what it effectively is, is there's a presumption of ownership of those. And for most responsible school districts that are trying, like we were, to, to form an identity, when you go to them and, and you pick up that they're, they're wanting to use your logo and you explain to them that, you know, we, we put effort, time, and uh, resources into it, they understand that um, they can't, they shouldn't really try to just, you know, steal it from you. And, uh, but it's usually a matter of just educating people why it's important to us to protect it. It's not that we resent some high school in South Carolina using our logo. It is that if we don't protect it, we can lose it. So the same would be true with if a, if a local vendor was using one of our logos. It's not that we would want to pick on the vendor. It's just that ultimately, if you don't protect that property right, you can lose it, and we don't want to lose it. Any other questions? Thank you very, very much. You know, I think that was uh, overdue to, uh, to a discussion about the logos because that's something certainly that uh, this board can be very proud, and as a school division, we can be very proud of. I really wish we'd have kept the art where we started, what we ended up with, so you could see the progression. Yeah. Um, it's amazing how far this piece of art came from where we started, from just a, basically a single wolf you couldn't see to this. So it's a, I, I wish we'd have done that, but we didn't. Uh, uh, hindsight's 2020, but uh, you, I'm amazed at where we started to where we ended up, and I'm sure you would be too. Yeah, that's something. Any other questions or comments? Thank you so very much well, for uh, that walk uh, in the past for just a few minutes because uh, that was certainly uh, 
very busy times and good times. Thank you. Um, the other, uh, the last item under information for the board is that I have uh, before you just a COVID report. Uh, I just handed this to you. Um, as uh, you're aware, um, in the last week, we have had um, three cases, student cases of uh, positive COVID cases. And so I'd like to share that with the board. As a result of that, we've had several students to quarantine. Um, to the best of our knowledge, uh, our students are doing well. Um, we do not, uh, at this point, think that this was a school transmission. Um, they came to school and we caught it, it was caught very quickly. Um, and the two um, were related, and then the third one was related to one of the th two. So again, uh, we had not had many cases at all. And then in about a, a three to four day span, we had three, but they were all related. So from that, uh, students have had to quarantine and uh, they should be back uh, now on um, Monday the 29th and we're anxious to have them come back. Until that time, um, these students will be virtual. And so again, uh, we're anxious for them to come back and from all reports, everyone is doing well. And so we're glad of that. So um, just any questions and comments, we try to have these um, up to date and sent to you daily so that you're aware of that. As you can see, some of our schools have no cases reported, um, and, uh, and that's wonderful. And it's been that way for several weeks. I, I think um, I, I sent one to the board, and Mr. Hicks responded, and he said, I, you know, this is great news. And we really felt that way, that it was great news, the, the, the low number that we had, no, no cases or quarantine. So, any questions or comments on this? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mullins. Mrs. Robinson, will you please tell us about good news from our schools? Oh, it's my pleasure. I'd like to ask uh, April Hay. Ms. Hay, if you can come to the front, please. And you have before you, Ms. Hay has, um, has a uh, a brochure, 17th Annual Lonesome Pine Poetry uh, Competition. And Ms. Hay, I think you have some of your students with you, don't you? Oh, that's wonderful. And some of our parents, thank you so much. Well, good evening. I wasn't expecting to be put on the spot here. I thought it would be the students, but needless to you say, You can certainly, I'm would you please uh, introduce the students? I think they would feel much more comfortable if you, if you were to do that. I, I will introduce the students, yes. Yes, thank uh, you. So needless to say, I'm a little unprepared, but <clears throat> I am not speechless. <laughs> uh, back in February, Mountain Empire Community College, in conjunction with the John, John Fox Festival, held their annual literary writing competition uh, it was the 17th annual Lonesome Pine Poetry and the 34th annual Lonesome Pine Short Story Competition. Um, they announced their winners uh, in March. And if we were not known in February, Ridgeview Middle is definitely known now. Out of six possible placings, we took five of them. So I think we did a really good show there. So I, do, I did invite uh, I had four students in my class that won, and I invited all of them. I think I have two that were able to come tonight. Uh, one is actually um, residing in North Carolina, so she could not be here. But for our uh, poetry competition, and as Mrs. Robinson told you, I didn't put together a little packet today for you of all the, the winners, so I thought you might enjoy reading what they have written. So for our writing competition, in our first place, we have Ms. Callie Calhoun with her poem, Anxiety. Callie, could you come to the front? If, thank you. Uh, in second place, we had Mr. Brody Vanover with his poem, uh, the Peaceful Pawn. I don't think Brody was going to come, but I'm not sure if he made it. 
And in third place, we have Miss Emma Gibson with her poem, Stress. And Emma was the one that does not live in the area. And would Callie's family please stand also to be recognized? Thank you very, really, very really much. Thank you. And for the short story competition, we had an eighth grader who placed first uh, Presley Strauss with her story, Souls of the Sky. And our third place winner was Anderson Robinson with his uh, short story, The Spy Who Never Died. So I would, have, I would like to take a moment to say that I'm extremely proud this year because last year I had one winner. It was a third place in poetry, so this year we ruled poetry. And we also took a spot in the short story, so I'm really proud of the students. And uh, Ms. Hay, we would love to have your picture with the students. And, and would Anderson's family please stand also and, and be recognized? Uh, thank you so much for being here, sir. And thank you. If you could send that to us or send it to Ms. Hay, thank you so much. All right, thank you. And again, congratulations. And thank you for attending. Thank you. Well, it's huge. Great. Yeah. Good news from our schools. Always good when we begin that the day that way. Uh, at this time, we'd like to ask Mr. Uh, Setzer to please come to the front and, and talk with us about our attendance enrollment. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Uh, for the month of February, we went, ended uh, with 1,912 students. That's actually down five from the month of January. A uh, slight decrease there. Tidbit of good news, though, I ran the numbers today. As of today, we picked up 14 in the month of March. So uh, <laughs> hopefully this, we have, have a week left. Hopefully those numbers will hold or even climb further. Uh, as always in your packet, you have all the attendance percentages, the list of transfers, and the pre-K numbers on the very last page. Uh, as we always do, we'd like to commend the schools for their hard work and attendance, and I'll recognize two this month, Clintwood Elementary with a 98.88% attendance rate, and Sandlick Elementary with a 97.87% attendance rate. I'll be happy to answer any questions the board has. Thank you, Mr. Sitzer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next will be the approval of the 2021-22 budget. Mrs. Robinson. Um, I think it's um, update of the new elementary school. Yes, our next agenda item is update on the new elementary school. And Tim Burge, Mr. Burge. I couldn't see him. Welcome, Mr. Burge. Uh, on your table is a, a report that looks like this. Uh, we send this to the core uh, team each month, and we also share this with the Board of Supervisors, and we always copy our board when we share this information with them. Mr. Burge, welcome. Uh, Mr. Mullins, if there's anything uh, that you need to uh, add to that, please do uh, as we move forward. <coughs> Welcome, sir. All right. And you'll notice he has a uh, wolf pack uh, mask. <laughs> he came by to get one today. Thank God I had one. <laughs> uh, uh, good evening. Hope everyone's had a good day today. And school projects uh, starting out a little slow, but we're going to get moving. Um, they've already started uh, getting equipment here to start erosion and sediment control measures tomorrow. They will be actually smart at starting to install those tomorrow. That's the big news for today. Um, they, of course, they've put up the temporary fence. 
Uh, the office trailers are set up. Uh, AEP was here on Monday to uh, disconnect the uh, secondary loop of power so that we can reroute the power around the building. Um, they were also here yesterday to look at getting power uh, to the office trailers. Um, we uh, also uh, had proposals back for the procurement for, uh, for uh, testing and inspections for the building. Um, that has uh, been signed and approved. Um, we have the four construction drawings. I picked them up this week. So we have those drawings in hand now for construction. Um, uh, we're still waiting on the verification of the DEQ permit. I think we are very, very close. Uh, I think the ENS permit from the, from the county uh, uh, inspector was issued, was, was signed today. So that, I think that was the last piece for the DEQ permit. Um, so things are moving pretty well. Hope, I wish they were moving faster, but now if we can see some ENS going in and then they're going to start relocating uh, some utilities and stuff under the building, uh, start building the building pad, and we've got to put two sediment ponds in temporary. Um, so things should be in the next week or two, you should yeah, really see some good action going on out there on the project. Uh, got a few photos. And bring them up. Mr. Rollins. I'm working on them. No. Okay, here's a couple photos. The one on the left here is what it looked like at the 1st of uh, March. And then the one on the right is what it looks like now. Cuisinbury has put up their little logo on the fence instead of the green fence. Next. Um, this is a couple photos. Uh, the one on the left is when they set the trailers up. The one on the right is where it's us today. Um, McFall was setting up their GPS system today uh, so they can locate all the inlets and outlets and elevations uh, with their equipment. Um, so they were here today getting ready to start tomorrow. Next. <clears throat> and then here's a couple pictures. We got some conduit on site so they can start putting conduit in the ground and then equipment has showed up on the project. Hopefully next month we'll have some real action shots of what's going on on the project and some dirt being turned over. Any questions? Should there be any, uh, Mr. Burge, uh, with the, um, uh, the few day delay of DEQ, should that impact um, the right now, the, the schedule at all or? It is, it is beginning to affect the schedule, but uh, uh, Cuisinbury is working on a plan for the uh, schedule to work on weekends or whatever they have to do to get it back up to schedule. Okay. On schedule. Anything else? Mr. Mullins, did you have anything to add, sir? No, I think, I 
think as we go on with this, if you keep up with your work progress summaries on a monthly basis, it's a good way to uh, track the budget and to, to track the activity that uh, is going on out there. And uh, We really appreciate the organizational skills that Scanser brings uh, to just helping us keep up with everything that's going on. Absolutely. And, and like you said, on the monthly reports, you can see where we are on the schedule. And you can also see, like you said, the budget, what's going on with the budget. Anything else? Any other questions for Mr. Burge or? All right, thank y'all. Thank you. Next is the approval of the 2021-2022 budget, Mrs. Robinson. I'm gonna ask Mr. Vickers and uh, Ms. Taylor uh, to uh, present. I think you uh, <coughs> welcome, Mr. Vickers. <laughs> You're getting to be uh, a regular here, sir. So it's good to have you with us again. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, it's a good habit to have. <laughs> <coughs> good evening, Mr. Chairman, board members, uh, Ms. Robinson, uh, Mr. Mullins. Uh, it's good to be back uh, uh, with you again. Um, before you, uh, you have a document uh, revised as of today. Uh, this is the, uh, the final budget document that we'll be presenting to you. Basically, it's the, uh, the exact same document you saw uh, during the public hearing. We did make one small change to one line item, and I'll bring your attention to um, page two under other funds. We did have listed a, uh, equipment, a security equipment grant it was listed there. Uh, it is not going to be renewed for next uh, year. Uh, it is a flow through grant uh, in and out. So we have removed that from the revenue item. We've also removed the, uh, the non-wage capital outlay on page three uh, for that exact dollar amount. So uh, you will see the, uh, the overall amounts uh, decrease. Uh, of course, the overall budget uh, pertains to several of the things we've discussed in the past. 5% uh, compensation supplement uh, for all employees, uh, static or, or stable health insurance premiums, uh, small adjustments for inflation and some other equipment changes, and of course some flow through amounts for the, uh, the COVID uh, rescue funds that will be coming through. Uh, bring your attention to page 7, which is the last uh, page uh, in the program. Uh, the total budget of 29438000 $815. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have before uh, uh, we go to the approval phase. While the bird board is looking at those. Um, just a uh, reminder that next Monday, I'm sorry, next Tuesday, March the 30th, um, we will be meeting with the members of the Board of Supervisors to present this budget. Um, I think the consensus of the board was that the chair and the vice chair uh, would attend that meeting with us along with members of the Dixon County Education Center and the VPE if they would like to attend. Also yesterday, um, we met in a Zoom meeting with those members uh, representing those two um, organizations and had a good meeting uh, with them. Uh, and I appreciate Mr. Vickers very much and, and Ms. Taylor uh, presenting that to our staff members. So that will be next Tuesday at 1 o'clock. And um, then we will present the budget officially to them on April the 1st. Mr. Chair, we if there are no will questions, Mr. Chairman. I'll turn it over to uh, Ms. Robinson for uh, for the call for the vote. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chair, we will need a motion uh, if the board uh, is ready to approve the budget uh, as presented. I move we approve the budget as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. 
discussion of the Virtual Regional Academy and Senate Bill 1303, Mrs. Robinson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, we, uh, last month, we talked a great deal uh, regarding the uh, virtual program and um, felt that we would be ready uh, this month to have a recommendation to the board. Um, after our meeting with our administrative, uh, administrative staff on Monday at 9, uh, we felt that the consensus was that we would ask the board for additional time uh, for several reasons. One was uh, to let us evaluate the cost of the program. Uh, number two was to uh, have a list of prerequisites uh, for virtual students to be a part of the virtual program next year and then uh, we would have a final recommendation. We have looked uh, at one extensively, the, others, the other program we uh, are familiar with. The one that we have looked at extensively is called Ingenuity. It's a K through 12 program. It provides, and I do have a, uh, you do have that red pamphlet there, uh, brochure is regarding this program. Uh, it is a program K through 12. We have met with um, them now s twice and then had the presentation with our administrative staff on Friday. If we had to look at a program, this is probably the one that consensus is that we're leaning toward. Uh, the quality of instruction seems to be um, excellent. Uh, they do provide tutoring um, for our students. They provide a wide array of courses uh, for our students. House Bill 1303 is now awaiting the, the governor's signature. And there may be some changes in that bill. We've heard that uh, through um, meetings with superintendents. But basically what the bill says now is this, uh, that we are going to return uh, next year. We must offer face-to-face -face, uh, for the 21-22 school year and that we may offer a virtual program. Um, in discussions with our administrators and our leadership staff, our plans in August of 21 <coughs> is to return five days a week face-to-face uh, -face instruction. Knowing that, we know that we will have uh, students and parents and families who will choose a virtual program and we feel that Ingenuity will offer our students in the virtual the best program, Ingenuity will be that program. Uh, as you know, any cost for a student of the Dixon County Public Schools to be a part of a virtual program, the cost will be uh, paid by the school division. Parents will not need to pay for that, um, but the school division will pay uh, for a student's participation in a virtual program. They are our students. They will remain as our students. They will get to participate in extracurricular activities. Everything else that all of our children get to do. They will only be receiving their instruction virtually. Uh, some of the prerequisites that we are considering as an administrative staff, number one is that the child and the parents have a um, adequate internet access. I think that has been a, as you know, uh, a significant issue for our county. And although I know that the Board of Supervisors and Mr. Barton are very actively involved in trying to resolve that, we feel that that has to be a, a prerequisite. Uh, another prerequisite that is being proposed, um, not finalized, is that the student remain in the program for a semester. Um, that way, um, it, you know, uh, there is a commitment by the family, there's a commitment by the child that he or she will be there for a, a semester. We started out that way, I was telling our administrators, we started out that way this year, but there were so many extenuating circumstances that children were sometimes in and out, in and out, and that caused confusion for children 
and confusion for parents, confusion for schools, and so that may be one of the prerequisites um, that are being considered. Um, good attendance um, and a standing grade point average may also be uh, part of the prerequisite. Again, we, we will have time to talk about that. So we will begin in August, five days a week. Our teachers on staff will be teaching face-to-face uh, -face children. For those families that choose uh, for their students to be virtual, we will be offering uh, one, either Virtual Virginia or Ingenuity, although our staff, uh, our administrative staff is leaning toward Ingenuity. And since they are our students, uh, the school division will be paying uh, the, um, their participation in that program. And so I just wanted to just bring you up to date on that, give you an opportunity to ask questions and also then um, to be prepared for a recommendation in April when we've had enough time. We only received the proposed cost yesterday, and so we just needed more further time to evaluate it. Questions or comments? How closely does Edgenuity's um, curriculum align with ours? Fantastic. Uh, Mark and Mike uh, participated in that. I'm sorry, Mike, could you say that louder? Yes, with the core class in particular, it aligns with the Yes. And they're all uh, aligned with the standards of learning for Virginia. Uh, in K through 5, there is one teacher that a child will have who will teach all the courses. In other words, there won't be several teachers. It'll just be one teacher, correct, in K through 5. And then in 6 through 12, uh, of course, they're, they're because of the endorsements, they may have other teachers. But we just, we really, uh, I think the consensus, uh, and Mr. Mullins and, and Mr. Setzer, correct me if I'm, he, I'm I wrong, our administrative staff liked uh, the um, the communication that the program has with parents, uh, the communication that students can have with with uh, with teachers. Um, they just felt that this program better served the needs of our students, and so I'm. Um, uh, I, we were very pleased with that. No program is going to be perfect, of course. Uh, we know that, and there will be ups and downs and, and all of those kinds of things, but um, the, uh, overall, we felt it very good about this program. Mr. S excuse me, Mr. Setzer, was there anything else that you needed to add? Mr. Mullins, anything else that I left out? Questions from the board. If ingenuity is what we decide to go with, <coughs> will that be as joining as Region 7 Academy or would it just be us and ingenuity? Great question. No, sir, we will be joining. We are part of the virtual uh, regional academy for Region 7. Um, Region 7 um, has provided it, its counties the opportunity to either remain with uh, K-12 stride uh, with virtual Virginia or with ingenuity. And so uh, we will still be a part of the virtual of 19 counties of that. There are several counties that are looking at ingenuity. Uh, there may be one or two that, of course, that may be uh, going with K-12 stri stride. Just to bring the, just a note, the issue with K-12 through and stride was that we would be responsible to take other students from other areas in the state with ingenuity. We do not have that responsibility. What we would like to also to do is to incorporate ingenuity in all facets of our curriculum. For example, in our alternative program, New Start, to have ingenuity. For our homebound students, ingenuity. For um, remedial uh, summer school credit recovery, uh, edgenuity. So we'd like to incorporate edgenuity not only for our virtual students,
who choose to, uh, whose families choose that next year, but to have it in all areas of our instruction. Have they given us a cost per student? They have. Um, <clears throat> someone. It is. Their regular rates are 3000 but because we're a part of this virtual Virginia or virtual academy, the rates would be cheaper. And I'll be glad to send the board uh, those costs. Uh, House Bill 1303 is for one year. Um, it does uh, end at the end of 21-22. Of course, the bill could be renewed at that time. Uh, we all know that. And as we've talked about as a board, you know, virtual learning may be a part of our, um, of our instruction for, for quite a while. Um, the, one of the reasons that we're looking at five days a week uh, next year is that as a school division, I think we're just as concerned about the well-being of our children as we are academically. Uh, I've talked to many, many parents whose children uh, feel isolated, uh, who are, uh, they lack, they miss the interactions with other students, they miss the interactions with uh, teachers, they miss being in clubs, they miss their friends, um, and, and of course then the academic is also a huge concern because if we don't address the, the academic soon, then that gap just widens as it goes on. So. When we're looking at this program, um, we are respecting that parents will want to go virtual, but we know that at some point we may have these students back and we want them as prepared as possible um, and we want them to be able to transition back to face-to-face -face instruction uh, without any other upheavals in their lives. I'd like to thank our administrative staff. Uh, that included all of our principals our central office staff, um, everyone, um, and um, good, good presentation and good uh, meeting on Monday discussing the options. Other questions or comments? Mr. Hicks, did we answer your question, sir? You did, you did, and then, and of course it led to another. Yeah. Uh, but as you talked about being able to bring um, ingenuity more into our current curriculum, would it, would it offer us the ability to maybe expand course offerings? Yes, yes, absolutely. And um, that is one, you know, that question has been asked in the region and that's I think where it came that it was 200, at the high school level it was $225 or something per course, is that correct, gentlemen? Something that way. Right. Yes. So it, yes, I would expand that. We just know that virtual uh, is going to be part of our instructional program. So we're just trying to get ahead of it. Um, and hopefully then uh, get our students, our parents and our students back into face-to-face uh, -face as soon as possible. It's also going to be um, our teachers won't have to have the face-to-face -face <coughs> and the virtual. Uh, I know that that has been uh, wearing on our staff and our teachers and it's just been difficult, especially uh, when you're trying to do both and children may not have internet, all of those issues. 
we always worry about the child that doesn't have internet because that's an inequality in itself and they can't get the instruction that other children with internet access receive. So. Other questions or comments? So we will have a recommendation to the board in April. We will have a, a presentation of Edgenuity so that the board uh, is very uh, comfortable with it if, it, if that's the recommendation. We will have the cost breakdown. Uh, we will also have um, what the proposed prerequisites are for the board's consideration. And then uh, whoever it is, they will do, they will meet with parents, they will have their open houses with the virtual parents and the students, they will set all of that up. And so very quickly they'll, they'll get to know the students and the families. Hearing. Thank you, Mr. Mullins. I think this brings us down to the approval of the 2021-22 school calendar. Mr. Mark Mullins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, good evening. Um, just to briefly review a little bit about what we talked about at the February board meeting regarding the 2021-2022 school calendar, uh, we looked at two options uh, last month. Uh, we had come up with those two options with uh, working with our school administration. Uh, they're very similar, not a whole lot of changes, uh, differences in those two. Um, the, the main differences in the two options, of course, are the beginning date of school. The, the beginning date of school affects, of course, when the first semester ends and the ending date of school. So those are the main differences in these two uh, calendar options. Just to briefly go over and touch on uh, some of the uh, items that are in or dates that are in both options of the calendar and then, and then the differences. Uh, both calendar options, uh, of course, have uh, Labor Day, Election Day, uh, as non-school days. Uh, both include a week at Thanksgiving for fall and Thanksgiving break. Both include two weeks at Christmas for Christmas break. Both include a long weekend in March for spring break. Both include a long weekend in Easter for Easter break. Um, the differences, option one, school would begin for students. The first day of school for students would be Monday, August 9th. The first semester would end uh, Friday, December the 17th. So the first semester would end before uh, as we <coughs> broke for Christmas break. And the last day of school for option one would be Tuesday, May 17th scheduled. And we realize that probably will not be the last day of school, but that would be the scheduled last day of school. Option two, uh, the first day of school for students would be Thursday, August 19th. The first semester would end on Friday, January the 14th, which would be uh, mid-January. And the last day of school would be scheduled for Friday, May 27th. Um, we did mention, and I'll mention again, that it does appear that the state will allow school divisions next year to have up to 10 uh, virtual learning days that can be used for inclement weather uh, or other emergency situations. So that would definitely help in making up the number of days of, of school missed next year. Of course, anything beyond those 10, we would look at adding that to the end of the school calendar. So we looked at those two options uh, last month. We shared with the board that we were going to survey uh, our staff and survey the parents in the community. And we did that. Um, we've got some survey results here I'll share with the board. Um, first, we had total between the two surveys, we had right at uh, close to 500 participants. So that we had, we had quite a few folks participate. 
the faculty and staff survey, we had 232 folks uh, participate in that. Option one had 100 votes for 43%. And option two had 132 votes for 57%. So faculty and staff favored the August 19th uh, opening or beginning date for school. The parent, guardian, and community survey, we had 254 participants. Uh, option one had 142 votes for 56%, and option two had 112 votes for 44%. Almost identical opposite uh, as far as percentage-wise. Uh, so we, uh, and almost, if you add those together, you're almost identical numbers of the votes, very close. Not exactly identical, but very close. Um, so basically, it looks like from our survey, and we did the survey for a week, March the, we, we left the survey up for a week, March 10th through March 17th. And again, so faculty and staff uh, favor at 57% uh, the uh, August 19th opening date for school. The parent, guardian, community survey favor at 56% the August 9th opening date for school. I think the school division, the school administration has determined we can go either way. Uh, I think I shared that with you all at the last meeting. And uh, that's all I have. <laughs> it would have, been, would have been nice to have a, a little bit more. <laughs> it would have been there. We, we always look for you. You like to have one favorite one way 60, or 60, 40 at least. Yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> I agree. Are, are everyone on the same page? <laughs> <laughs> I agree. And, you know, usually you do kind of have one favorite one way or another. But uh, I'll try to answer any questions that you all may have or review anything we've talked about in the past. What's the major difference between the start dates? Uh, just for what we've tried to do the last several years, and we actually have, of course, until this year when everything changed, but we have tried to end the first semester at the Christmas break for a couple reasons. And in order, in order to do that, you have to start a little bit earlier. In order, and we've tried to get 90 days. This calendar has 88 days for the first semester. And the, and the reasons we've tried to do that is um, mainly for SOL testing at the high school where the students switch classes at the uh, semester. Uh, those who are enrolled in SOL related classes, which they need for graduation purposes, and it's not all students, but you know, it's a good number. Uh, that would give them the opportunity to take the SOL test before they leave for Christmas break instead of have a two week break, <clears throat> then come back, and we try to schedule at least two weeks after we come back, one week to review, one week to take the test. But the thought there with the high school administration, especially in the years past, is that gives those students that opportunity, and it's better for them. Um, by doing that, though, you have to start earlier. And of course, I shared our high school administration said after this year, they realized they can do anything. His preference would still be, uh, Mr. Compton, the principal at Ridgeview High School's preference would still be to end the Christmas break at, uh, I'm sorry, to end the first semester at the Christmas break. But that's the main difference. And then Mr. Ashton, of course, starting on August the 19th, uh, you know, we'll end the first semester in January. We'll take those SOLs in January. Also, there's been an issue, uh, and, and it's come up, and it does affect uh, students who are enrolled in dual enrollment classes. You know, they follow the college's schedule. So uh, if you go ahead and end at Christmas, I know they generally start a little bit later in January, uh, but sometimes you run into weather. You can't end at a certain time. Uh, so those have been the two issues that we've tried to get a, a semester in prior to the Christmas break. And then the other part of that is the later you start, the later you end. And, uh, you know, we never know what the weather's going to do. Uh, those are all factors that definitely we can't predict. I think this year it would at least be more predictable than in past years with the 10 days you'll have. you got a good shot at 
you, you know you'll get those 10. Yeah, you'll have those 10, yeah. so. And we did talk about it. I don't think you can, you know, you can't plan on it because you don't know. Some years you, you miss 20 days and some years you miss five. Right. But uh, those 10 will definitely help. This year we know for sure we've had 12 Code Green virtual learning days. We've had four um, no school days or Code Red days. So that's 16 days that we probably would have been out this year. No one knows what next year brings, but. Yeah, which is probably the most we've had in a while. Uh, it, it varies. Every yeah. year it varies. You know, uh, 16, 18 days, pretty, pretty regular. That's pretty regular? common. Yeah. Some years we don't have. Team, we you know. we missed quite a few in 1977. Uh, <laughs> 47. I used to have a chart, Mr. Ashton. Yeah. I usually carry it with me for, for these kind of talks. I don't have it. Well. That was a tough year, for yeah. sure. Uh, what's the minimum number you can have in the uh, semester? First semester, what's the minimum you can cut off? We try for, we shoot for 140 seat hours, instructional hours at the high school level. So uh, when you're doing 90 to 95 minute classes, you know, when you get down to about 87 <coughs> days, you're cutting it really close, of course. The, there is an option there that the um, division superintendent can waive those number of hours. You generally try to get those number of hours in. You shoot for that. You plan for that. And we're expected to plan for that. So we would be very close at 88 days. But we would have a day or, or two to work with. <clears throat> okay. I don't think we've ever went below 86. I'm not positive. Yeah, that was the voice, sir. Sometimes you have to go over into January no matter what. I mean, you just miss. And Any more discussion? Well, I like uh, option one because the first semester ends before the Christmas break. And uh, although the staff didn't like that as well as, as the parents did, but still, uh, I, I think there's a benefit in getting the first semester over the way before being out of school for a length of time. Do we need that in a motion and approval of agendas? We, we will need an agenda. We will need a motion to approve the calendar. Yes. Dr. Lyle, is that a motion or? I, I move we adopt option one. Do we have a second? I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I have to vote no just because of that one little percentage point there. But I think both options are so close that either one is going to work fine. Motion carries. Our next agenda item is approval of the proposed VSBA policies. Mr. Setzer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the board, I have two groups of policies for your review and uh, consideration. Uh, I put them in different groups uh, because of the nature of the changes in the policies. Group one is very easy. Uh, the changes that were made to these policies uh, are very minor, not significant. It's usually just an uh, update to the uh, cross-reference or uh, legal reference, or they may have changed a word, for example, he or she to the members or the member. Uh, so it's our recommendation for Group 1, that group of 18 policies, uh, that they be approved as presented. And hopefully you all have those, or at least they the, do. Uh, I wanted to share with the board and with you, Mr. Setzer, that they have those, both Group One and Group Two policies. <clears throat> Any discussion?
We have a motion. I motion to approve the, as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Chair, with group two, I'll take just a few minutes and um, go over the changes uh, very quickly. Uh, you should have a sheet in your packet that's basically numbered one through nine as far as the policies we will be talking about. Uh, policy number one, BDDC, which is the agenda preparation and uh, dissemination. Uh, as the board knows, the agenda is not official until it's adopted by the board. Uh, until then, the superintendent, along with the chair, develops a proposed agenda for the board's consideration. And that's the change of that policy. The VSBA has added the word proposed. Any questions on number one? Number two, BDDH, and it's also policy KD, public participation at school board meetings. The VSBA uh, in the past has required us to do a regulation of that policy. That regulation is what Mr. Hicks reads before every public comment. Uh, the VSBA BA is now recommending that that regulation go away and that you include it into the body of the policy. So if, uh, if you look up, I think it's page, if you'll flip over about four pages, I included a copy of the actual policy. Basically all, I did, basically all I did was take the regulation that Mr. Hicks reads before public comment and inserted it into the policy. So the regulation will go away and the policy, it will be a direct policy. Now the difference, and I'll have to lean on Mr. Mullins a little bit here, but the policy is in the intent of the board. The regulation is developed by the superintendent of how we will make the policy, your intent, happen. So basically the VSBA is recommending that we do away with the regulation and include it in the actual policy, which I did, if that makes sense. Any questions on that one? And Mike, to be, to be clear, the end product will be doing business as we Nothing turn. changes as far as business. He will still read the same thing just as he does. And you have a, a separate packet that, like, that looks like this that has that information. But, but some of what we read now is not policy now. No, it's the regulation right. to the policy. It will become policy if the board so approves. And technically, I think the board did approve the regulation, so it's basically policy anyway. But uh, we're I think the VSBA is trying to clean up, and as a result, we'll have to clean up as well. Number three on the list is KN, Sex Offender and Crimes Against Minors Registry Information. Uh, this policy was changed primarily because legislation uh, reclassifies sex offenders. Uh, the old system was sex offender, violent sex offender. Now they have went to a tiered system, tier one, two, and three. Tier three is basically the old violent sex offender status. And as a result, you see policies four, five, six, seven, and eight listed below that. They have been updated to reflect the change in the classification system. Uh, policy number six will no longer, will delete it. It's KNA, violent sex offenders. And the tier system will be incorporated into policy KN. Uh, so basically that's the reason for that change is because of a, a the law changed reclassifying sex offenders and violent sex offenders as either tier one, tier two, or tier three. Any questions on that? And if you drop down to policy nine, suicide prevention, JHH, um, this policy has been updated and as a result, the superintendent is required uh, to develop procedures and we will present those to you as an informational item in the near future of how to address contact with parents and what happens if we feel that a child is suicidal in our schools. So based on that, we ask for the board's adoption of the eight policies and the deletion of the one policy, KNA, 
as presented. If there's no question. So moved. Second. We have a motion to adopt. Yeah, Mr. Rasnick uh, made that motion. I'm Mr. Rasnick made that motion. Do we have a second? I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> this concludes our open session and time for board comment. And I guess I'll go first today. And uh, I was just thinking with uh, April Hay making her presentation. Um, this is really this has really been wonderful, and we have some talented little writers, and we may have some new David Baldacci's here. <laughs> um, I'd so also like to make the comment that I was over at UVA Wise yesterday and was talking to some of the nurse practitioners, and uh, one of her sons came in who works for Norton Community Hospital, and they got to talking about Ridgeview High School and everything that had been done over there and the son had never been here to look at the facility and they, they were also oh you need to go you need to go it's, a, it's the greatest facility in southwest virginia and not only is it the greatest facility the education uh, it is wonderful and that made me so proud to hear that so that's all i have to say and dr lyle i'm interested in seeing how the virtual regional program is going to go uh, other than that i think we've uh, done well th this afternoon evening so far okay um yeah i'd like to congratulate those riders as well uh that's that's quite an accomplishment uh, for sure and to get what was it five out of six yes yeah that, that's pretty impressive I did find it interesting that in, in the poetry section of it, that two of the titles are anxiety and stress. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, and I think that really reflects yes. uh, what students and administrators and our teachers, yes. but uh, everybody involved, uh, parents, is kind of what this is being like, uh, you know, and, and they really reflected that in there. Um, but even in all that stress and that anxiety, uh, I want to take a minute to just brag on our teachers because I was uh, happened to be in a conference about uh, is a virtual online conference. It's probably been about a month or so ago, and uh, it's on YouTube. And so there's thousands of people in this conference. Well, I look over in the comments because people are commenting the whole time, and uh, I see one of our teachers' names pops up there, and. Uh, you know, and just to be able, it was flying so fast, just to be able to catch one in there uh, was, uh, was kind of amazing. And, but, uh, you know, and, and this was on a virtual day. It was still, you know, she had virtual duties at that time. So not only was she fulfilling her duties teaching, she was also trying to slip in some time to improve herself and improve her skills um, at the same time. Uh, you know, with all the anxiety and the stress and all that has been going. And, and I really think that that speaks to the, the caliber of the teachers we have in the county. Uh, and it even speaks to the caliber of those people. Uh, since then, I, I know that there's more than one of our teachers were in that, that thing since then, but they have, uh, uh, they just didn't make a comment, so I didn't get to see it. But uh, I thought that was, uh, was really something. And I'd shared that with the board, I just hadn't shared that in comments here. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm always impressed by what, what folks are doing and, and taking on extra uh, at the same time. Uh, we mentioned I was pretty, pretty excited. I heard uh, this week that we got uh, Go Guardian here uh, within the, the county. Um, and if you, if you don't really know what Go Guardian is, uh, we're piling it as well. So I've got a little bit familiar with it, but it filters contents out for our students. Uh, whether they're on campus or whether they're off campus. Uh, so it's uh, really helpful in trying to get our, uh, uh, to keep our kids safe from what they see online. Um, and another great part of it is I was very impressed with the teaching tools that go along with it. So I mean, teachers can, 
can certainly, when they log on and their class are going, they can see every student's Chromebook, whether they are a remote student or whether they're uh, sitting there in front of them in class. Um, and so that, that can be pretty helpful. I, you know, I've already seen some kids get uh, YouTube busted more than once uh, <laughs> since Go Guardian is on there. Um, I really thought it was funny. Uh, the first time we sat on a webinar to see this, and one of my uh, co-workers, he's got, a, he's got a son that's in, the, I think, the second or maybe third grade, and he sat beside his father while they were doing this uh, presentation. And uh, he shared with me that after it was done, his, uh, his second grade son said, you mean that thing's going to snitch on us? <laughs> and he said, yes, son, yes, it will. Um, but and not only that, the teacher can share the screen out, and that can be shown to students whether they're sitting in the classroom or whether they're sitting at home. So I think that's going to be a big help to our, to our teachers. And, and I know that that's something that uh, they've got some, some training and things coming up on that's going to be helpful to them. So yet again, in the midst of all of this, we're still trying to improve our skills and do those things. So, so my hat's off to them. Uh, Ms. Robinson, I would like to think that this uh, achievement would get some wide dissemination uh, that those students and their teachers have achieved regarding the writing. But I'd also like to take this time again to thank uh, the teachers and the parents and grandparents and caregivers and custodians, cooks, bus drivers, everybody, school nurses, everybody that helps bring our children forward and keep them that way. When in reading that story, and I, th I wish everybody could read it, talking about anxiety and stress, the two, two of the writings that won in that competition, uh, I suspect they could identify not only a lot of our students, but the teachers and parents and other caregivers as well. Uh, we've come a long way, and I think, we've, I think it's been handled well, but we've got a ways to go, and I just hope everything from here on out goes very good, and let's do everything we can to make it happen that way. Yes, sir. We're, we agree. I like all the sentiments that uh, everyone's had about uh, the writing students. Uh, what a great job that they did. I um, think that uh, very, very nice to recognize that. And uh, several have mentioned uh, the teachers involved with that as well. Uh, appreciate that as well. Um, also add that you know I'm pleased with the budget process uh, this year. I thought it was very well prepared. Thank you all for doing a great job. Um, not had nearly as much to say this year on the budget as I did last year, so I hope that's a good sign. <laughs> I feel like that, uh, you know, uh, that was anticipated things to have, you know, I, I anticipated more issues than what we've had, so I'm very happy with how that's worked out. Um, I just was thinking about it during the meeting uh, tonight about if we have, you know, if things continue to go this, you know, we had a, a good year next year with, um, the budget cycle, um, I was thinking about, um, you know, if we're able to uh, start looking at um, upgrading our uh, bus fleet, one of, I think one of the things looking down the road in the next few years and having younger students travel a little um, longer distances of looking at uh, seeing if we're able to get, um, you know, air conditioned buses for a few of those routes. And it takes time to revamp the fleet, but, um, down the road, if things are going well, I, I hope we, as a board, consider that as a, as an option. Um, yes, but like I said, once again, very pleased with uh, where we are right now. Look, looking forward to next month, next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Hackney. At this time, we will now go into closed session. Pursuant to section 2.2-3711, paragraph A of the Code of Virginia, there will be a closed meeting for the purpose of employment issues relating to discussion or consideration of specific individuals for employment as substitutes, FMLA request, consideration of specific individuals for employment as substitutes, FMLA request resignations, retirement request, post advertised for the director of instruction, pre-K-6 grade resignations, Retirement request post advertised for the director of instruction, pre-K, sixth grade teachers, two, to consult with legal counsel pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A1788, of the Code of Virginia. 
Is there a motion to go into closed session? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We're now in closed session.